I'm Dr. Alberto Panera from the Bios Orthopedic Institute in Sacramento, California. Excited to present this great case to you today. We're gonna to be talking about in-office intraosseous bioplasty of the knee. This case starts off with an 81-year-old female who's had chronic knee osteoarthritis for approximately 15 years, but she does note a change over the past six months where things have taken a turn for the worse. She's having a lot more medial compartment pain. She's also been fairly active and functionally, she's able to do less of her hikes. She's feeling a lot more pain when she's going up and down hills. She's also noted some more uh, mild swelling. She did not report any mechanical symptoms, no radicular symptoms down the leg or any neurological changes, just primarily this focal pain medially. As she's had this problem for a while, she's had uh, several different treatments. More acutely, over the six months, she did try physical therapy, NSAID. She did have a cortisone injection, which helped temporarily. She also had hyaluronic acid injections, which seemed to help somewhat with some achiness and stiffness, but still having some of that pain right focally on the medial aspect. When I examined her knee, she did not have an effusion. She had relatively good range of motion, but some limitations in flexion, no tenderness over the patellofemoral joint, but primarily medially over the joint line and over the medial tibial plateau. She did not have any ligamentous instability, negative McMurray's, but I did feel that she had a little more pain than I was used to when I was palpating over the bone itself. We looked at her x-rays, which certainly did show osteoarthritis. It seemed to be worse at the patellofemoral joint. She does have degenerative changes immediately as well. Uh, certainly this was known already, but because she had so much pain over the bone itself, I decided to obtain an MRI to check for any subchondral changes. Her menisci, you can certainly see that she did have a complex degenerative tear of the medial meniscus. But what I noticed in the area where she was really had more pain, not only does she have arthritis at the joint, but she had quite a bit of reactive subchondral edema, as you can see here on both cuts. So what does this mean? Well, we understand now that there's a relationship between the joint, the cartilage, and the subchondral bone. And essentially what happens is that when one starts to break down, it creates this inflammatory cascade or this negative feedback loop that starts to break down the bone, that creates more inflammation, that goes into the joint, and it's just con continuously trying to break the joint down, which accelerates the rate of degeneration. We also know that subjects who had bone marrow edema of any kind were about nine times more likely to get a knee replacement than subjects that did not have that. Now you could argue that this patient, given that she's 81 and already has quite a bit of arthritis, is already gonna have a knee replacement anyways. Well, maybe she doesn't want it, number one. Number two, there are other things that you maybe can accomplish by treating the bone. For instance, bone marrow edema is also gonna really increase the intraosseous pressure, which is gonna to lead to a lot more pain. So by treating that intraosseous edema, you might be able to functionally get her better by just reducing the pressure and improving her symptoms. So in this case, obviously we had talked about uh, what she's already had. You could try more non anti inflammatories Given her age, that might be a little tricky. Consider kidney and GI issues. We could try and unload her orthosis, more physical therapy. We can continue to repeat intra-articular injections. Certainly, I think a knee replacement has to be in this in the discussion because it is a valid option for this patient. But, you know, the patient was just very much against it. She felt she was a little too functional. She had some family members with not some uh, great experiences, and therefore she said, I am not getting a knee replacement. That's not for me. So what other options were there? Well, we could consider injecting cement into the bone, or we could actually try to get that bone to heal or encourage that bone to heal with an intraosseous bioplasty. Certainly there is data to support that. I think this is one of the bigger studies looking at what happens in 15 years, patients that have intra-articular injections versus subchondral injections. You can see a substantial uh, less number of those patients that had intraosseous injections had knee replacement as opposed to patients who had intra-articular injections. More of those patients ended up having knee replacements. So the concept behind IOBP is twofold. Number one is you wanna create an intraosseous decompression, which is gonna reduce the pressure, and then you're going to add your biologic to encourage the bone to heal. Now, this being an in-office procedure, I still think you should have a pre-procedure appointment because it is a relatively invasive for an in-office procedure. And what do I mean by that? Well, you're gonna be doing a bone marrow aspiration and then also an intraosseous injection. So you wanna make sure that you review that very carefully with your patient. I do recommend using oral diazepam as a sedative for the patient potentially consider some pain medications as well. I think this is key, certainly with your DME for like an unloader brace that needs to be fitted, she needs to get crutches. So you wanna make sure that that's all set up ahead of time so that way it's ready to go for the day of your procedure. 
For the procedure itself, the tools that we're going to use are Arthrex Angel Bone Marrow Processing Kit. We're going to need Allosync, uh, demineralized bone matrix. And if this being an intra-office or in-the-office case, we're going to use the foot and ankle IOBP kit because it contains a smaller 13-gauge cannula, which I think is more appropriate for in-office use. Patient positioning, I think, is also going to be key for the injection itself. You want to make sure that the knee is in extension and it mimics the position that it was on the MRI as you're going to be triangulating from the images on your MRI. Now, you want to make sure that that leg is elevated to the contralateral leg. As we're using both AP and lateral fluoroscopic views, you want to make sure you have a clean shot on your lateral and the other knee isn't getting in the way. Now, remember, in the operating room, a lot of times you're going to have devices. The patient will be under general anesthesia. The leg is going to be maintained and held in a very specific place. In a patient that's awake and maybe experiencing some pain as you're placing your cannula, that is going to be harder. So you want to make sure that you anticipate for that, whether it's with some straps or having someone hold the leg down, but just to make sure that you have the ability to keep that anatomical landmarks in that anatomical position consistent throughout the procedure itself. Now, we are gonna start with a bone marrow aspiration. Certainly, this is the first step. In my preference, you're gonna go from the PSIS. I recommend aspirating 60 to 120 cc's. If you're doing 120, I would recommend doing 60 from each side. Once you transfer it to the Arthrex Angel Kit, you're gonna centrifuge it at at least 7% hematocrit. I recommend going a little bit higher to about 10% hematocrit. And then you wanna obtain about five cc's of uh, concentrate PRP from bone marrow so that you're gonna be able to mix that with your bone marrow concentrate. Now, in terms of the pain itself, this can be a very painful procedure, not so much going into the bone, but once you start to inject into the bone, that pressure can be very, very painful. Now that pain will subside rather quickly, but that pain as you start can be pretty, pretty acute. Therefore, you may wanna consider doing some regional blocks. I think a genicular nerve block is a good place to start. It can be done. Uh, with fluoro. You may also want to consider doing an adduct or a saphenous nerve block if you're going medially, potentially even popliteal block, depending on which part of the bone you're going into. I would say that the latter you do have to do with ultrasound. The genicular nerve block can be done with both. There's actually data to support the relatively similar outcomes. Your bone graft preparation, this is a, a key element. You want to make sure that you have a good consistency. Remember, this is an in-office procedure, so you want to make sure that you pick the pathologies of subchondral injuries that are appropriate for that, and you're going to use a less dense mixture so that you are able to push it through the 13-gauge cannula. Our recommendation is to do 1 cc of allosync DBM and 5 cc's of concentrated PRP from bone marrow. Now, intraosseous placement, obviously this is key. This is where I think uh, fluoroscopy really comes into play. Certainly you can do intraosseous injection under ultrasound guidance, but I think fluoroscopy gives you much better direction once you're inside of the bone to be able to precisely hit your target and also stay safe where you know you're not breaking into the cartilage or into the joint. Now, the one point I wanna make here is to really take your time to identify your landmarks and get this in one try. Because if you start to puncture the cortex at different planes, you're gonna create holes in the cortex and once you start to inject your orthobiologic, it's going to follow the path of least resistance and essentially flow outside of the bone. So take your time, make sure you have a true AP, a true lateral view, make sure you really take your time to identify how you're going to advance that cannula to your target so you get it done in one, in one try. This is what it looked like on our case, and then we checked on the lateral, and you can see it's right in a very good placement, right where we want it to be in the middle of that bone marrow lesion. Now the injection itself, here is where you wanna be very gentle, very slow. As you can see here, I'm gonna push really slow. Initially, it's gonna take you about a cc or so just to even fill the cannula. So if you don't feel resistance right away, remember that it's probably not in the bone. Once you start to feel that change in resistance, you know that biologic is going in the bone and you wanna to start to advance very slow, really engaging with your patient, seeing how good those blocks worked or didn't, and really not try to blast through any type of pressure, which is gonna be quite painful. Once you encounter a lot of pressure where you're no longer able to push any more of the biologic through, that's where you wanna to start to do quarter to half to full turns and gently start pulling the cannula out. You're gonna do that still visualizing because you don't want to exit the bone. You're just trying to fill your track on the way out. Once you get to just before the cortex, leave the cannula in place for several minutes so that that bone graft has a chance to, to gel and clot in place so it won't leak out. 
Post-procedurally, non-weight-bearing status or weight-bearing status, I think that's going to be physician-dependent, but also more what type of lesion were you treating in the first place, how aggressive were you with the decompression, those things are going to play a big role. I think in cases like this, where you're looking more at reactive changes from osteoarthritis, where you're only using a 13-gauge cannula, really going into one place, one to two weeks is probably plenty of non-weight-bearing. I do, however, recommend using an unloader brace for four to six weeks and really making the patient understand that, hey, they're not gonna be returning to high impact activities. They're certainly gonna just be doing physical therapy until their next follow-up, and then we're gonna be progressing them gradually from there. So this was her outcomes in this case. Her acute pain, that pressure that she had been feeling for the past six months had resolved. She was also having quite a bit of night pain that resolved. She still did report having her chronic osteoarthritic symptoms, dull ache, stiffness in the morning. However, those were kind of her baseline symptoms, but not the thing that she was feeling for the past six months. Functionally, she was back to walking and doing the short hikes, so she was very happy about that. We did get a new MRI at the three month mark, and you can see here a substantial reduction, uh, close to 70% plus of the bone marrow lesion on the sagittal view. You can see the measurements there. And then coronal, you can see also a substantial reduction in the bone marrow lesion correlating with her reduction in symptoms. Now, I did get to see her past the three month mark. Around the 22 month mark, she reported she was still doing well. She was back to her normal function. She was still experiencing some of those chronic osteoarthritic symptoms, but that acute pain that she had had that we treated was gone. It never returned, and she did not end up having to have a knee replacement. Overall, a very successful intraosseous bioplasty of the knee. Thank you very much.